morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tricia Pauletta, the newly appointed chair of the FCC's WARC Advisory Committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to gavel in this uh, committee. We'll have to be virtual like our meeting ourselves because I don't yet have my gavel. But uh, uh, with that, uh, I am joined by our vice chair, Brian Tremont, and our designated federal officer, Dante Ibarra. And I'm now going to ask uh, Tom Sullivan, the FCC's International Bureau Chief, to uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia. Good morning to everyone. For those that don't know me, I am Tom Sullivan, Chief of the International Bureau. I know it's been approximately 10 months since many of us were gathered in Sharm El Sheikh, and Dante's still there evidently, uh, and clearly so much has changed since then. But what hasn't changed is the valuable contributions the WRC Advisory Committee plays to developing the U.S. positions for these conferences. So I sincerely thank each of you for taking on this very important role. I also want to express my appreciation for Nesse, Kathy, Dante, Ron, and to the excellent work from our Office of General Counsel for the uh, everything they've done to help get this advisory committee established. Now it's my honor to invite Chairman Ajit Pai to address the committee. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sullivan, and good morning to everybody who's joining us. It's an honor uh, to welcome you to the first meeting of the rechartered World Radio Communication Conference Advisory Committee, or WAC. Uh, this, in my view, is one of the most underrated entities of its kind. And the reason I say that is because if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find an entry for WAC, W-A-C, and it says... WAC may refer to, and then it lists, among other things, the World Association of Copepodologists, a type of crustacean, the Women's Army Corps, even the Wallandilly Anglican College in Australia, but you will not find the Work Advisory Committee. That's not just wrong, that's whack. I'm here all week, folks. It's only Tuesday. Anyway, this is indeed our uh, first ever remote WAC meeting, and so I'd like to kick it off by uh, thanking our newly designated chair, Trisha Paoletta, who just spoke, our vice chair, uh, Brian Tremont, and all of the informal working group uh, chairs and vice chairs for stepping up as industry leaders for this important work. As uh, Mr. Sullivan pointed out, the recommendations that this committee will provide to the FCC are really important. They're not only essential for us as an agency, as we develop uh, proposals for the WRC, they're a critical component of the broader U.S. government strategy of leading internationally in next generation terrestrial and space-based services and applications. Especially in these challenging times when we all seem to be pulled in many different directions, I appreciate the dedication that all of you uh, are bringing to this important task. This work is not for the faint of heart, needless to say. I didn't really know a lot about the uh, work or WRC process before I got this job, but now I have learned it's almost like a pro football game. What most fans might notice is the game itself, but there is a ton of preparation that goes into it before the game even starts, which is why things like uh, CPM and CTEL are now second nature to me. I got to watch the process throughout the last WAC cycle, accommodating in the challenging uh, denouement in Sharm El Sheikh last November. Even now in my darker moments when the demons come, I can still hear in my mind's eye the numbers 1.13, and it just it keeps me up at night. But seriously, I have a great appreciation for how difficult it can be to find consensus, but how important it is and how critical your work here on the WAC is to helping us solve some of those problems as early in advance as possible. I also have a greater appreciation for just how uh, critical your specific tasks are in preparation for the WORK 19. The previous WAC produced nearly 100 recommendations for us to consider. Now, these recommendations were, in many cases, the basis for the U.S. proposals at the conference, and in all cases, helped us to be better, better prepared. Uh, we want to see that replicated, of course, this time around. Uh, thanks in part to the uh, work of the previous WAC, we achieved some successes at Work 19 across a range of different issues. We increased global spectrum harmonization of emerging 5G mobile networks. We enhanced wireless broadband access via satellites, uh, NGSO, uh, GSO, and ESIMS. We enabled communications in high, uh, via high altitude platforms in rural and underserved areas. Uh, we added a new satellite system to the global maritime distress and safety system. And we scored some damn good free coffee in the annex by the conference center, which I think helped us cinch all the successes that I previously mentioned. 
Now, I anticipate that this new WAC 23 cycle will once again produce an impressive number of recommendations. You certainly have a tall uh, order on your hands, given the 26 agenda items that I understand are on work 23. The topics range from mid-band spectrum for 5G, IMT, to new inter-satellite space-to-space links, to Earth stations in motion, once again, ESIMS, to enhancement of aeronautical and maritime safety communications, important topics all. Now, before I let you get back to this mountain of work, I do wanna take a moment to recognize the spectacular FCC team. Our fearless International Bureau Chief, Tom Sullivan, always on the case, always in a tie. Uh, your WAC designated, agents, designated agency officer, uh, Dante Ibarra. Ron Marcello, who will be providing support to the uh, WAC and the working groups. And the talented group of experts and uh, who will be helping us prepare for Work 23. And Neshe Gundelsberger, Louis Bell, Larry Olson, Catherine Medley, Clay DeSell, Eric Grodsky, Michelle Jackson, Sunker Persaud, and Alan Yang. I can't say enough what a great effort they put in the last time around. They really do exemplify what it means to be a public servant. And I know that they are gonna hit it out of this, the park this time as well. And at least I think that their efforts along with yours give us a fighting chance to get the whack as we know it into Wikipedia. Anyway, now without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it back to Dante, stop vamping and let the experts take over. But thanks again to everybody for participating. It's going to be a great advisory committee and look forward to hearing uh, what you come up with in the time to come. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate those rousing remarks. And, you know, with that, I'm even more excited to begin the work of the WAC. And as you noted, you know, there's we've got a broad, broad agenda. I've had the satisfaction of serving as a vice chair of one of the informal working groups. So I know how hard the chairs and vice chair are going to work this cycle. We've got a, a pretty big agenda as much as last year, and the chairman noted how uh, much we achieved and how much of the U.S.'s success at the last walk really did begin at the WAC. And it, it is, it's a very special process. We're going to get into Wikipedia, Mr. Chairman, I promise you. If, if nothing else, I'll, I'll try to do the editing, but it is very special because each of us are here representing an individual company or a particular trade association, perhaps, interest. But Together, we have to do the hard work to negotiate and, and do the puts and calls, make the tough compromises so we can recommend to you uh, proposals to negotiate with your, your fellow agencies so that when the U.S. does submit proposals to CTEL, our regional body, it really does reflect a, a rigorous balance and you know a, a very informed view of, of the range of interest there. And that's because of the hard work we do here at the WAC, our proposals tend to get a lot of support at CTEL. And when you look at what came out of CTEL last cycle, uh, much of it, again, originated in the in the, the previous WAC. So it really is a, a source of the U.S. success at, at the work. And part of that is because of the FCC's wisdom in creating this open and transparent and sometimes difficult and rigorous process. And of course, we couldn't do it without, as, as the chairman noted, the very uh, strong support of the International Bureau. We know all the FCC staff are hardworking, but the International Bureau and particularly the, the WAC folks and those who have the work portfolio work extremely hard around the clock, give up their weekends, working in all time zones to, to get us, you know, and keep us on track. So uh, I wanna thank them. And again, thank in advance the chairs and vice chairs and the whole WAC membership. I know many of you are veterans and we're going to work really hard. We're going to try to have less than 100 recommendations because we're going to try to get more cohesive consensus recommendations for you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but, you know, I, I am looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your leadership and your time with us today. And I'll now ask uh, Brian if he has anything to uh, add. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. I would only second uh, the, your, your wise words about this process and thank the chairman again for the honor of serving as the vice chair. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to working with and learning from everyone around uh, the WAC and the staff uh, and facilitating the kind of collaboration and uh, um, compromise even at times to drive towards uh, positions that advance the interests of the American people. I think this is a particularly challenging time for WAC uh, with the challenges to communicating and being together in person. And I think it'll call on all of us to have uh, maybe even more patience than usual and uh, and use the new tools of communications and, and that we've all been adapting to over these last few months to make sure that we continue to do this important work in a prompt fashion. 
Uh, it is challenging from a distance. Uh, in the old days, we could all sit down in a room sometimes and get some of these things done. And this time we're gonna have to do it all remotely. Uh, but I know that we're all focused on the prime directive here, which is making sure that the American people uh, get their interests represented as we go through this process. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Tricia, who I, I believe we're gonna move forward on the agenda. Yes, that's right, Brian. And uh, but before we do, I, I, I wanna thank Sean Spivey there too. I see he's with us and uh, we anticipate a lot of your involvement, so thank you for that as well. Now, if uh, members have uh, questions or want to make a comment during the meeting, uh, you just need to identify yourself and, and who you represent, and uh, the good folks at the FCC will take care of uh, making sure you can ask your uh, question or your comment. But at this point, we're going to bring up the agenda, which is WAC 23, document number one. Okay. And uh, this document has been posted on the FCC website. Uh, hopefully those of you uh, who are WAC members have taken a look at it, but I'm going to uh, call for approval of this agenda so we can begin our formal part of the meeting. Do I have approval? You have a motion to approve, but I'm not sure everyone is seeing the agenda up. Uh, at least I'm not seeing it up, maybe others are. Uh, I, I did see it, but, um, whoops. Trisha, I can see it. It's Jane Sankavich. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Jane. Okay, and so with that, we are uh, now working through our agenda. And I believe, uh, Brian, you are going to uh, discuss the second document of the WAC, number two. That's right. I'm going to turn it over to Dante to go through this, but this is the, the rules of the road for the WAC going forward. As I believe everyone knows, uh, we are subject to the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which is the guardrails for these types of processes for ensuring transparency uh, in the process as we go forward. So um, this is an important kind of, uh, as I mentioned, guardrail um, conversation that Dante is going to lead us through next. All right, thank you very much, uh, Trisha and Brian. Um, we're just going to just no take note of this document. It has been available on our WRC WAC webpage for, for some time now. But really the important uh, things here with regards to the charter um, are really the, the scope of the work that uh, the committee will be considering. Um, and that is essentially to uh, provide recommended proposals on matters related to World Radio Communication Conferences with emphasis on the WRC 23 agenda. And you'll note uh, in the charter we have all of the WRC 23 agenda items. Um, and each one of these agenda items are then allocated to each of the uh, informal working groups uh, with regards uh, to their particular discipline or radio service. So we will get into that uh, particular allocation of agenda items to each uh, one of the informal working groups or IWGs here uh, later in the meeting. But as you can see, we have a large number of WRC 23 agenda items um, that uh, we will uh, focus our, our work on and ultimately developing uh, recommendations uh, before the, uh, the committee that will eventually be uh, considered in and sent forward to the uh, chairman of the FCC in order for, for, for consideration. Uh, and and uh, basically that is all this uh, document addresses. I'll turn it back to you, Trish yeah. and Brian. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Dante, for that uh, review of the charter that lists the agenda items for this uh, upcoming work. And now we'll look at the working methods document, which is document three. Yes, thank you, Dante. Over to you. All right, thank you again, Tricia. Um, so I will uh, just uh, briefly go through these slides uh, and then about midpoint, I'll turn it over to our, our representative from the Office of General Counsel. And mainly the purpose of this uh, document is to sort of give some insight into some of the, the process 
of the committee and the informal working groups, as well as uh, some of the, uh, the ground rules on how we will uh, uh, perform our activities uh, in accordance with uh, the federal, um, uh, the FACA uh, Act. So um, with that, I'll just uh, also mention that uh, throughout the, the meeting today, if uh, anyone has any questions on anything, any of the documents or any of the uh, discussion, um, you can email your questions to livequestions at FCC.gov. You should see that at the bottom of the first slide here. And uh, we will monitor this box uh, throughout the meeting. And at uh, certain points throughout the, the meeting today, we will pause and, and try to answer uh, those questions um, that uh, uh, that is sent in by uh, the by our uh, audience. So uh, again, we will go through several items here, as you can see. Um, so essentially, our, our objectives, as I mentioned in the charter, is to provide the FCC with advice, technical support, and ultimately the recommended proposals. Uh, for all uh, for the ITU World Radio Communication Conferences, um, and again, this the scope of this will address all of the WRC 23 agenda items that I, I quickly went through in the uh, charter. And as part of this process, the committee will will provide recommendations initially on uh, U.S. preliminary views, and as we progress throughout the uh, the process and cycle of this WRC, eventually culminating in actual recommended proposals. Uh, briefly, the structure, uh, the the committee is broken in, broken down into four different informal working groups or IWGs. We are essentially using the same structures we used the previous uh, WAC cycle um, with the IWG one uh, addressing the maritime, aeronautical, and radar services. IWG two will be addressing all of the agenda items associated with terrestrial services. IWG3 will be addressing all of the agenda items associated with space services, and that includes satellite and science uh, services. And IWG4 will be addressing those uh, agenda items of a regulatory nature. Just briefly as a, an illustration of the WRC US prep process, um, the green box that you see is essentially the activities of the committee. Um, and as you can see, the FCC is the, the, uh, the main uh, entity that receives the, the, the advice of the committee in form of the recommendations. Um, we also provide uh, this uh, information via public notice. And so the, so the public can also comment on the activities of the WAC uh, and provide those comments directly to the FCC. In parallel to, to the WAC activities, uh, NTIA also has its Radio Advisory Committee, um, which deals with uh, also WRC preparations, and each of the federal agencies are, are participants of that process, whereas on the FCC side, it is the commercial sector and industry and the public that pro provide uh, uh, their participation in um, comments and, and uh, inputs uh, in our process. So, so there's similar processes in a way, um, they're parallel and eventually they will meet uh, here in the middle where we will take the WAC recommendations and we will reconcile those with the federal agency side on the NTA process. And hopefully the outcome of that reconciliation will, will, will culminate in an agreed US uh, proposal that will then be coordinated with State Department. And then ultimately with State Department normally agreeing, if, if there is agreement between the FCC and NTA on a US proposal, then the State Department advocates that and transmits that to the regional group, uh, CTEL. And ultimately CTEL gathers all of the proposals uh, and harmonizes those proposals into inter-American proposals on behalf of the region and those are submitted to the conference as a regional proposal. Um, just getting into some of the logistics uh, regarding our meetings. Um, our WAC meetings typically meet uh, three times per year. 
And that's mainly driven by how CTEL, the regional group, as I mentioned earlier, meets. So we tried to schedule our meetings around uh, those dates. Um, CTEL typically meets twice a year, but normally we will try to meet three times a year in order to, to try to meet those that CTEL timeline. The meetings are typically held at the FCC, but uh, as you know, now we're in, a, in this new situation, so we're now meeting virtually. Uh, all of our meetings uh, are announced via public notice and also are, are noted in the Federal Register. The informal working group IWG meetings can meet as many times as they want, depending on, on the schedule of the WAC. Um, those meetings can be held uh, via teleconference or any other electronic means. And those meetings are also announced uh, via FCC public notice. Perhaps I can pause here briefly um, if we have any questions. Um, maybe I'll ask if uh, my colleague Neshe has anything that she would like to, to present in form of questions from the audience. Um, so far, I have not seen any questions. Okay, so then we'll uh, proceed. At the end, we'll also take a, a pause for questions. Okay, um, perhaps I'll turn it over now to, uh, this is uh, getting into some more of the, the uh, area of the Office of General Counsel, so I'll turn it over to my colleagues there if they would like to, uh, to uh, take these next slides on, and then just let me know when you would like to advance to the next slide, please. Sure, this is Paul with Silberthal. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dante. Um, so I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of background on the Federal Advisory Committee Act and um, as appropriate um, to some background on some of the GSA regulations under the Act. Um, so there are several guiding principles under VACA, which are openness in government, diversity and balance in membership, both on the parent committee and on the working groups, and public accountability. Uh, next slide. Um, we are required by statute to give timely notice of the full WAC committee meetings um, and reflecting the times that the FACA was written, um, there has to be 15 calendar days notice in the Federal Register, which nowadays is a bit challenging because they are backed up due to current situations. Um, however, um, we also try to be user friendly and we provide notices um, on the internet, um, on our website, and through other media. Other media. Um, I would note that while mo in various other advisory committees, um, most of the working group meetings are um, conducted uh, privately. In your case, my understanding is that your working group meetings are often open to anyone to observe, um, which is good. And in that case, uh, you don't have to give Federal Register notice, um, but we try to give, um, you know, issue PNs and other things so that once they're open, um, everyone has timely notice. Uh, turn the slide. So one thing that FACA requires is that the full committee meetings be open to the public. Um, and people can submit written statements should they want. Um, and observers, members of the public, uh, to the extent that time permits, are allowed to um, speak or address the committee, although uh, often we encourage just the submission of, of comments. Um, I want to mention, because it might be relevant to your activities, that in some limited circumstances, um, portions of meetings could be closed um, to the public um, with the approval in advance of the chair of our agency, and we'd have to give prior notice in the Federal Register. This involves a process, it involves OGC, it involves the chair of the agency. Um, so if there is something coming up that staff or members of, of the WAC believe involve any kind of classified material or national security matters or any kind of trade secrets, um, please get in touch with Dante and then Dante's folks would get in touch with OGC and we could begin the process to 
close just that portion of the meeting that involved um, this confidential information. It's rare, but it does happen. So um, please coordinate with Dante if you see an issue coming up there. Okay, next slide. Uh, basically, as we say in the slide, uh, under the FACO, we're required to keep um, minutes of meetings and a record of people present, et cetera. And all documents of the committee, whether it's transcripts or recommendations, minutes of meeting, um, uh, other you know, public aspects, must be available for public inspection. Many times we put the key documents on the website for our advisory committees just to make it user friendly. Um, but if there are other documents that people want to see that for whatever reason are not posted on the website, um, you can get in touch with the basically with the DFO um, and um, those could be made available for review. Next slide. So um, your committee chair um, and Tricia and your vice chair, Brian, are um, especially important people for this process because they um, are sort of a focal point if you have questions um, and they'll work with the members and with the FCC staff in establishing the informal working groups and in conducting the meetings and suggesting meeting agendas. Next slide. Um, the DFO, who is Dante in this case, um, have specific duties that are actually designated by the GSA rules governing advisory committees, which is calling the meetings, approving the agenda, um, attending the meetings. Um, in this case, the working group meetings um, are often attended not by the DFO because there's only so much time in the day for the DFO, but um, by other liaisons that would be working with Dante and with you folks. Um, and um, our DFO maintains the committee records and um, you know ensures that all proper uh, meeting um, minutes are taken. Next one. Uh, someone who is more familiar with the details of record keeping will talk very briefly when I'm done, but basically um, records are required to be maintained in accordance with a general records schedule. Um, and we need the help and assistance of all committee members to ensure that, um, that we can keep the records properly that we are required by law to keep. Um, and that means that we, I think that this has been mentioned to you, we request that all committee members, full committee and working group, should copy um, your FACA specific mailbox on all communications with each other relating to the work of the full committee or the working group. And um, also just so that all the FCC staff are in the loop as we are required to be, um, please copy on all your communications as well, um, the DFO and for working groups, please copy your um, your liaison, your FCC uh, liaison to the working group. Okay, next slide. So um, as you know, you operate through the your informal working groups and the working groups are created to gather information, but not through surveys. We'll deal with that later. Uh, develop working plans, draft preliminary views and proposals, um, and discuss your preliminary findings. Um, it's next slide. It's there. The working groups have somewhat fewer rules and more freedom to conduct business. As I said, your work can be done um, in private as opposed to public meetings if you want. Um, it's very important that the working groups understand that all of your recommendations have to move up through the full committee. 
um, because you do operate informally, um, it's important that you, the working groups not function as de facto full committees. Um, so a working group can only make recommendations. The, the, the final decisions are made by all of your group, um, all of the WAC by, by majority vote. Um, and the working group cannot make decisions that are binding on the full committee or speak on behalf of the full committee without prior um, approval of some sort. Um, and finally, because everything has to be funneled through the full committee, the working groups cannot make recommendations directly to the FCC commissioners or chair. Those recommendations move to the FCC formally only after a full discussion and formal vote by the full committee. OK, next slide. Um, so the one thing I wanted to mention, and I don't think it comes up as much with your group at all as with some of the other groups we have, but um, because um, in a sense, our, our FACAs, our arms of the FCC, um, are the activities to some extent are subject to the Paperwork Reduction Act, which um, puts constraints on the ability to do surveys without jumping through quite a few hoops. So if there is something about which you are thinking of doing a survey, please don't. Um, it is fine to ask open-ended questions, um, and we can, at OGC, and Dante would coordinate, we can work with you on that. Uh, so we can post general questions on the website um, for outreach um, that would avoid the Paperwork Reduction Act, but you can't ask very specific, detailed questions to more than, I think it's 10 or 11 um, entities or people without triggering the PRA. And the problem is, if the PRA um, is triggered, then there have to be steps to get OMB approval. Um, and, you know, potentially even the results of the survey couldn't be used. Um, so you just don't want to go down that route. Um, I don't think in your case you're going to be even thinking about doing surveys, but if there's some sort of general issue on which you would like some public input, please let Dante know and he'll work with our PRA experts in the office so that we can uh, structure the questions in an appropriate way and we won't have to worry about um, the PRA uh, being triggered or even potentially violated. Um, as I said earlier, um, the working group meetings um, are not subject to the public participation and notice requirements of FACA. Um, but if you do decide you want to open them up, as you often do, then everyone needs to be invited fairly. You can't sort of partially open a meeting just to five or six people you like the best. So either they're sort of totally closed or through appropriate unbiased public notice, they're sort of open to everyone. Um, and I should mention that the number of committee, of full committee members serving on a working group should be less than a quorum of the full committee. And the reason for this is if you have more than a quorum on, serving on the working group and everyone is there in meeting, then you've somehow converted the working group into a parent fact. So we want to try to avoid that and, and create the distinction between how the working groups can function, which is more informally, and what has to be done for meetings of the full parent committee. Okay, slide. Um, so there have been some questions raised about, um, <clears throat> you know, who can participate, because in many cases, people have both um, a primary member and an alternate. 
So the basic thing to keep in mind is that at any meeting, whether it's the full committee meeting or a working group meeting, um, only one person from the organization should be the active participant. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, even if two people are there, one should be doing more of the talking and be responsible for the voting. The other, uh, the alternate, if the person is there, is more than welcome to observe, but um, shouldn't be taking taking over. Um, we try to give everyone a chance, fair chance, um, to participate in meetings. Um, at the IWG meetings, um, if the meetings are closed, if you're holding a closed meeting for the IWG, then the attendance should be limited to those people who are appointed as IWG members or you know, alternates. Um, but <clears throat> if it is a closed meeting, nonetheless, it's perfectly fine for other people of the parent committee or other members or alternates for the IWG to sit in as observers. <clears throat> Sorry. Obviously, if the IWG meeting is an open meeting, then anyone who is a member of the public or associated with the WAC or the working group can attend. But again, in terms of who would be active at the meeting, it should be limited to the, um, the informal working group participants. Um, let's see. And <clears throat> as the slide says here, anyone who attends as an observer um, should not be making proposals, should not be participating in debate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, occasionally at the working groups, um, there, there will be someone who is not a member of the working group, but who has substantial expertise in that area. And it's perfectly <clears throat> fine for the working group to vote to have that third person attend and to provide a presentation or you know answer specific questions. Um, but once that person's part in the meeting has concluded, that person would, if it's an open meeting, just revert to observer status. Or if it's closed meeting, the person would be asked to, you know, leave the meeting and the just the working group members would attend. Okay, next slide. I guess I've addressed part of this already. Well, which basically says if um, there's a particular issue in which, oh, well, this is within within an organization. If you have a member, but maybe the member for that organization is not the person with the most expertise on a particular issue, it's perfectly fine for the working group to, in, to invite someone else from that organization to speak to the particular issue that's being considered. Um, but again, uh, after the person has concluded the presentation or answered the questions, um, that individual would sort of revert to observer status. Um, and no matter how many people from an organization happen to be attending or observing a working group meeting or a full committee meeting, it's only one vote per organization which I think everyone is aware of. Okay, next slide. Um, so briefly on the ex parte rules, as some of you know, um, uh, putting aside FACA issues, if there's a rulemaking going on and um, someone goes to the decision makers, whether it's the key bureau staff people or the commissioners and makes a presentation uh, that will trigger the ex parte rules and sort of in a nutshell usually people are required the organizations required to submit some sort of letter for the record that documents 
the presentation that was made to the um, to the commissioners or to the other decision makers at the agency. Um, in the case of our advisory committees, often there will be um, decision makers present at the meetings of either the working groups or the full committee. And often the subjects will be matters that involve pending rulemakings. So we typically, and we have done in this case, issue um, a public notice that creates basically a temporary um, exemption from um, our ex parte rules for communications of this sort by either members of the full committee or members of the working group so that as you're holding your meetings, when you're discussing things that hit upon um, rulemaking issues, you know, you don't have to take notes and then file immediately file ex partes within however many days um, our rules required. Um, but we also, in, as we explain in the notice, provide that to the extent that at some later point in the rulemaking, um, the decision makers might be relying on matters heard at your meetings or um, by committee members representing the WAC. The commission staff would take the role of um, submitting later on ex partes for you. Um, and so this public notice has been issued um, to cover, um, you know, your your meetings. So you're all set there. The only thing I would caution is a lot of people, of course, wear two hats. You might sit on an advisory group about something, but perhaps you are also the lead person at your organization responsible for, um, you know, speaking to the FCC on behalf of your organization as opposed to on behalf of your advisory group. To the extent that you're wearing the hat of your organization um, and speaking about rulemakings that hit on the same things that you're doing in your advisory group, but you're just representing your organization's views, then the exemption would not apply and you would need to file an ex parte on behalf of your organization. But if you're meeting with people and you're wearing the hat of the advisory group, then the um, the waiver in our PN would kick in. And if you have any questions about which situation applies, you know, feel free to, um, you know, to let Dante know and we can try to clarify that for you. Okay, next slide. And finally, just a note because, um, you know, a lot of the issues our advisory committees cover are sort of hot topics and occasionally, um, you know, the media wants to find out what's going on in a working group, what does it look like the recommendation's going to be, um, you know, how does the chair of a working group or a member of a working group feel about a particular issue, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, if you are speaking about things that have been fully voted by the full committee, obviously there's not an issue. You just say, oh, well, last week the committee, you know, our full committee voted X, Y, and Z. And that's perfectly fine. Um, a lot of times the committee hasn't voted, neither the working group nor the full committee and you might just be expressing your own individual views about where the committee should go on something, that's perfectly fine. But in that case, please just make very clear in your presentation or your comments, whether it's in writing or in some sort of an interview, that in those situations, the views you're expressing are your individual views, not the views of the full committee. Um, and yeah, we have had some issues with this inadvertently in the past. And so that's why, you know, I'm mentioning this because sometimes there have been reports that 
quote, the committee believes X, Y, and Z. And it really wasn't the committee. It might have been one person or two people, and they were giving their own views, and it got all sort of messed up. And then people got upset because maybe the committee hadn't even voted on something. We may have lost Paula. Um, does every uh, sorry. Trisha? Yeah, sorry. I, oh, there. I didn't OK. Um, and I would also just say in concluding on that, if you if you're submitting an opinion piece or something for, you know, letters to the editor, et cetera, um, if you're submitting it after something's been voted <clears throat> and you're doing it sort of officially for the full committee, that's fine. You could say, you know, so-and-so chair or member of X, Y, and Z. But if, again, it's your own individual opinion, then you probably shouldn't sign that opinion piece, um, you know, in a formal, in any way that sort of suggests that it's um, the views of the full committee or working group, et cetera. Um, and I guess that's about it. And if there were questions, I'm happy to answer any. All right, thanks, Paula. Um, and as I said, folks can send their questions to livequestions at FCC.gov. So to continue, um, I wanted to see if our records folks wanted to add anything here since we concluded with the slides from Paula. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, this is Doris Gamble. Um, I work with Tony McGowan, the records officer for the FCC. And I'm just going to reiterate what Paula went over as far as records management goes. Um, so real briefly, so the uh, National Archives and Records Administration oversees all federal agencies records management programs. Um, and as such, uh, the Federal Advisory Committee records are maintained in accordance with General Records Schedule Grant 2. Um, and uh, Dante, as the, as the designated federal officer, will share a copy of that disposition authority, and it'll spell out exactly all the different types of documentation that you're required to keep. Um, our job at the end of the year is to roll up all of the documentation and records and um, accession them to the National Archives, um, because the work you're doing is important, and you know we need to make sure that it's captured um, and, and appropriately. Um, and, and transferred. Um, so the disposition schedule, the general record schedule 6.2 is media neutral, uh, meaning it applies to all records regardless of format. So the timing of how long you keep certain records um, applies no matter whether that record is paper, if it's an email, if it's an audio visual record, etc. cetera. Um, however, it should be noted that uh, we're trying to comply with a December 31st, 2022 NARA deadline, um, which says that all documentation going forward are to be electronic, with the exception of any of the meetings that are going to be recorded. And those will be in a digital format that we make sure to comply with National Archives requirements. We work closely here with the AV staff at the Commission for all recorded meetings. So you don't have to worry about that. So what does this mean for all of you? Um, Actually, we've tried to make it pretty easy for all the committee members. All you are required to do from a record keeping perspective is ensure that the DSO, Dante in this case, has a complete and accurate record that documents the committee's deliberations and decisions. And so, you know, the simple way to do this is to make sure that every committee member copies the DFO on all emails pertaining to the business of the committee or its working group and also copy the FACA specific mailbox, which is WRC23 at FCC.gov. Um, and Dante will send out an email from this mailbox with the FACA GRS schedule, which I was referring to. Um, and that pretty much it as far as records management responsibilities. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you very much um, for that. Um, and no that's a perf that's a perfect uh, segue into our FCC listserv. Um, 
as stated uh, as part of the the record keeping requirements um, we we have organized uh, a listserv uh, for the committee as well as the the IWGs and these are just uh, some brief instructions on how to do that uh, to become part of the those listservs um, as part of the uh, uh, the records keeping requirement, we've also uh, incorporated that the WRC-23 at FCC.gov FACA mailbox is also part of these groups. So any message traffic that is sent across any of these listservs will also be copied to the WAC uh, mailbox. So, so, so that'll help facilitate uh, folks forgetting to copy uh, that mailbox. It's already been covered. So these uh, instructions are, are relatively simple. You just send an email to, uh, to subscribe at info.fcc.gov, follow the, the instructions there in particular to which one of these listservs you want to be uh, subscribed to, and then uh, it'll be uh, taken care of uh, and you'll have a subscription to those particular groups. If you have any questions or any sort of issues with trying to subscribe, please let me know. Um, we can certainly facilitate uh, adding you or removing you at some point uh, if you'd like, uh, but uh, please let me know. And this is uh, just again a reminder of our, our committee website on the FCC.gov uh, page. Uh, you'll see the address there. This web page will contain all of our information for meetings. It will contain uh, any public notices, uh, any associated WAC or IWG documents, as well as any reference material uh, related to what we've discussed today, including the charter structure. We will also be posting a listing of all of the committee members. Um, you'll see again the instructions on how to become part of any of the email listservs. Um, and eventually we will start populating this uh, website with all of our uh, uh, reconciled uh, US uh, proposals that we send to the regional group CTEL, and we will eventually start linking those here so you can have a handy reference as to what's been reconciled and what is being sent forward on behalf of the administration to the regional group. So that's all I wanted to, to discuss on the uh, website, um, and we'll pause here for any live questions. I'll turn it over to Nishay if she has any for us to, to try to address. Um, I do not have any questions. Uh, it was uh, to remind people that this presentation is available on our website. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so that concludes our, our, our slides for this. Um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Tricia and Brian. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Dante. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Nache. Um, and as WAC chair, I, I do want to encourage the chairs and the vice chairs of the IWGs to have open, publicly available meetings. And that has been the practice in the past, and I think it certainly uh, results in a more robust and uh, informed proposal to the FCC. So uh, I think hopefully you guys will continue to do that. All right, so now we will uh, move to WAC 23 document. Uh, 004, which is the structure of the informal working groups. And it, it basically uh, will list the chair and vice chair, which I'll review quickly, and, and then the different agenda items that have been assigned to each of the IWGs. Uh, so, uh, so, of course, you know your chair and your vice chair, and Dante is our DFO. You do the next page. And as Dante mentioned, we'll have the same structure uh, as in the past several works. So uh, listed here, IWG 1 with the maritime and aeronautical, IWG 2 terrestrial, IWG 3 space, and IWG 4 is regulatory. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, yeah, IWG 1 will be chaired by Damon Ladson, Vice Chair Greg Baker. And of course, this will focus on maritime, aeronautical, and radar. And, you can see here the various agenda items that the FCC has assigned. And our, the coordinators for this uh, IWG1 will be Luis Bell, Alan Young, and uh, Dante. Okay, and our next IWG, uh, returning in her, uh, you know, glutton for punishment role is uh, IWG Chair Jane Stankovich. And uh, this year she'll be joined by Jen Obenhausen as her vice chair. 
And again, we'll have uh, Dante and Luis as the FCC coordinators. And here again, you see the various agenda items assigned to the terrestrial IWG group. And as you'll note, each of these IWGs will have uh, agenda item 10 as well, which is the future agenda items to be negotiated for work 27. Okay, we can go to the next IWG. IWG3 is uh, going to be chaired by Zach Rosenbaum of uh, SES Satellites, the man rocking the best beard of uh, the WAC membership. Uh, Kim Baum will be uh, Zach's vice chair from Echostar. And of course, this is the IWG that deals with space services. Uh, because IWG3 does have quite a, a, a robust agenda, lots of issues, they've got a, a slightly broader group of coordinators uh, headed by Clay DeSalle, Catherine Medley, Eric Brodsky, and again, Dante. I guess, Dante, you're ex officio on all of these as our DFO. Okay, moving to IWG4, uh, the regulatory issues. Uh, we have uh, uh, new to WAC, David Goldman. Welcome to the WAC party, David, from SpaceX, who will be chairing IWG4. And uh, his vice chair will be Giselle Creaser, certainly a WAC veteran from Intelsat. And the coordinators for this will be Clay and Dante. Yeah. Okay, are there any questions on the structure and the uh, allocation of agenda items between the IWGs? Um, I have a question from live, sir. Uh, the question is, other than subscribing to the list, sir, are there any additional processes for a VAC member to be a member of any of the IWGs? I believe there are not. I'll let Dante answer definitively. There, there are no other procedures once you've been uh, applied and you've been uh, approved uh, by the FCC, then you're a full-fledged member and the listers are simply a means to participate in the actual communications, uh, email communications uh, between the IWGs and uh, any other listers associated with the, the WAC. I, I should know for anybody very new to WAC, um, we have always done the IWGs virtually, so we've always done conference calls, so that, that will seem normal as we uh, move into that stage. Obviously, it's uh, late August, and uh, you know, the year, because of COVID, we're obviously a little bit behind our, our prep cycle, but as is much of the world. So we are going to encourage the IWG chairs and vice chairs to begin coordinating now when your uh, next meeting will be. Uh, later on, Dante will review uh, kind of how soon you need to get that schedule in place. But we, since we are looking at our next WAC in a few months, uh, we do encourage you guys to coordinate and, and get going and hopefully have your first IWG meeting in the very imminent future. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brian for uh, the next document. Great, thank you. So this is uh, document 20, I'm sorry, document five rather. Uh, this is an update on NTIA's efforts to prepare uh, for work 23, and I think Charles is going to lead us through um, preliminary views that they've been developed, and we're going to just take note of the work that's already been done over at NTIA. Thank you very much, um, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for giving us a chance to brief you on our efforts. So in uh, the uh, IRAC and RCS process, we have uh, been able to process 12 preliminary views out of the uh, 19 numbered uh, agenda items. Um, so we've got a good start for the WAC uh, to take a look at, and we are eager for the IWGs to, to take up that work and look forward to coordinating that work with you. In addition, you'll notice on the cover page, we have identified the priority agenda items for the federal government. So that's something to, to take into account as we go forward. I would note that our uh, uh, structure in the radio conference subcommittee is a little bit different than the, the structure that you have. We, we also have four groups, um, but our groups are, are composed slightly differently, but uh, it shouldn't cause too much problems in us working together in resolving uh, to uh, come up with uh, US preliminary views and proposals. So uh, it should be, uh, fairly easily uh, uh, 
uh, rationalized when, when we're looking at the, the different groups. So uh, your, your IWG1 is closer to our working group two your, your, and, and, and working group one in the RCS is closer to, to your IWG2. So the, those are sort of swapped. We have a separate science group instead of uh, uh, lumping the, the science and satellite groups together. Um, and our general issues, uh, regulatory issues are handled in an ad hoc group uh, that will take up its work towards the end of the cycle to address agenda items two, four, and 10. Uh, and other than that, the regulatory issues are spread uh, among the four working groups that we have. So uh, we do look forward to working with you and uh, we hope that uh, it will be a very productive WRC 23 cycle. And with that, I will turn the document over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Charles. Now, at this point, we'll take any comments or clarifications, but I do note, um, consistent with what we just discussed, <clears throat> these documents will be transferred to the appropriate uh, working groups, informal working groups, uh, for their consideration and reactions as we go forward. And we obviously will have another opportunity to react at our next meeting um, coming up in a few months. But are there right now, Neshe, any uh, comments uh, or is anybody else, uh, any public comments or any from the members of the WAC on presentation from NTIA and their preliminary reviews thus far? Um, I have not, uh, but uh, if I have one, I will definitely uh, come back. Thanks, Neshe. Anybody else? All right. Start off as a quiet group. This is going to be very disorienting. Uh, all right. <laughs> with that, uh, Trisha, I think it's back to you for our future uh, schedule. Okay. Thank you, Brian. All right. Dante, will you pull up document number six on the uh, Work 23 preparatory timeline? And again, th this document is posted on the FCC's website as our on the, the work page that uh, Dante showed us, as are all the documents we reviewed. But uh, you'll see here we're having our first meeting. And what Dante's done is list the international meetings of the various working parties that are, of course, working on the, uh, the study side of the fence. Um, and then you'll see that our next meeting is October 20th. Uh, so we will rely on the FCC to get the Federal Register notice out, but uh, because of that, you know, it, it is less than eight weeks away. So we will really want the IWGs to, to get their work started and, and hold a uh, first meeting uh, very imminently. As we've seen, NTIA already has a number of PVs and we, 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 we don't want them to be lonely. So hopefully uh, the IWG groups will get working on PVs within their assigned uh, agenda items. And as you see, the uh, what we're doing here, I think you all know this as veterans, is trying to help position the FCC and the broader government for contributions going to the next CETO meeting. Uh, that meeting is currently slated for early December, highlighted there. It's the 36th meeting of PCC2, which is uh, the Permanent Consultative Committee uh, on radio communications, the, the Roman numeral two meaning on the radio side. So that uh, presumably still, you know, even though at this point officially they say it's, it might be in person, I, I think we can expect it probably to be virtual, but uh, so we, that is kind of our target. So that's the, the year. And of course, as we go forward into next year, but we'll like, like, you know, we'll have a rolling timeline for uh, WAC members to, to be aware of the upcoming deadlines, as well as the, the various working parties that are meeting in, uh, well, they're meeting, uh, you know, virtually as well online. Okay, any, anything Dante on the timeline? No, Trisha, I think you covered it very well, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, um, now we're going to move to other business. Um, there were a few folks who had um, statements on the, the kind of ethics disclosure issues, and uh, those are welcome for our record if you want to clarify kind of the position that where you are in terms of your WAC membership. But you can go ahead and in the interest of time and send those to the official WAC email, which is WARC23, WRC-23 at FCC.gov if you want uh, a statement in, in the official minutes of this meeting. And are there 
other comments or other business that anybody would like to uh, raise or discuss? Or Nesha, any other questions coming in over our connection? We have no questions. Okay, so I think with that, Dante, I, uh, I will close this meeting unless you're supposed to close the meeting. Um, yes, one quick comment, Trisha, before you close. Sure. Um, for, for those uh, WAC members uh, who would like to uh, uh, notify us that they were participating in today's meeting, please again email uh, that you were participating today at wrc-23 at fcc.gov and we will certainly include your name in the uh, minutes uh, of this meeting. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that reminder, Dante. All right, going once, going twice. All right, we're going to close the first uh, WAC 23 meeting of the cycle. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Trish.